Chapter 2, Christmas Traditions and Mirrors of Time William, Victoria, Francatelli and Nancy watched the huge Christmas tree present in the main hall of the mansion. It was a huge pine tree, 18 feet tall, leafy, and when they came close to it, it was possible to smell the natural fragrance of the pine, as if they had just cut it down. The tree was profusely decorated with ornaments representing different themes, such as angels, saints, snowmen, snowflakes, stars and animals, and many Christmas balls. Also garlands and electric Christmas lights. The tree was presided over by a large golden star. Nancy commented enthusiastically, pointing out the details that she liked most about the beautiful Christmas tree, while William and Francatelli listened smiling and responded happily to Nancy's comments. But Victoria only contemplated the tree in silence, with a somewhat serious gesture on her face, while she remembered her strange so vivid daydream of the previous night, by the similarity that she found between the tree that was in front of her and the Christmas trees that she had seen in her dream those trees that were also tall and beautiful and lavishly decorated, although with more ancient ornaments. The memory of those trees led to her memory of those people who were in the dream or hallucination, she was not sure, especially that woman who was identical to her, that twin that only existed in fantasy. She also remembered the last part of the dream or hallucination, when she seemed to be transported to another place and another era. Victoria tried to find all the possible explanations inside her head, from psychological to esoteric. I see you look very serious, Victoria, said William affectionately and with a charming smile. No, excuse me, William. Victoria replied with a smile between friendly and ashamed, it's just that the tree brings back memories, no doubt it's a beautiful Christmas tree, it reminds me of some trees that I saw somewhere, maybe in a movie some period drama. William, can I ask you a strange question? Victoria added between curious and shy. Of course, said William a bit intrigued. This house, is it possible that this house has ghosts? Victoria asked a little anxious, unable to hide her curiosity. Nancy and Francatelli sketched surprise gestures on their faces which in the case of Francatelli was followed by a funny smile and in Nancy's case by a gesture of scandalized reproach as if with the gesture she told Victoria, what the hell are you doing? Instead, William saw Victoria with a gesture between sympathetic, moved and a little sad. Well, until now we have not had them, the house is not as old as it seems, it was built in the 1930s by my great-grandfather, although he ordered it to be built with Jacobethan architectural style that's why it seems older. So far there have been no testimonies of ghost appearances, not even of my great-grandfather, my grandparents or my parents, but like most of the year I am in London, I do not know if perhaps the employees of the house who they are here all year have seen something. I can ask them, but why the interest? William answered kindly and with a smile a little amused, but not mocking. No, nothing, are my nonsense, it's just that a house like this seems to stimulate my imagination as a writer, possibly some new story arises from my stay here, I do not know," Victoria replied trying to hide the embarrassment under a nervous giggle. The others laughed too, although Nancy saw Victoria with a gaze of some censure. Then the group continued making a tour of the mansion, and in another room, they admired a huge nativity scene made in a corner. In the scene, the scenes of the city of Bethlehem and its surroundings in the times of Jesus were very well represented, with high hills and houses and buildings of that time piled up in the nucleus of the small city at the foot of the hills and some scattered in the slopes of the hills. There were shrubs and trees in miniature throughout the scene, and a stream with real water running through the hills and fields around Bethlehem, an artificial stream created by a small electric pump hidden from the viewers and had a powerful flow to be a scale reproduction. Small figures representing the inhabitants of Bethlehem, peasants, shepherds, soldiers, merchants and others were distributed throughout the scene. In a prominent place of the nativity scene was represented the manger where according to tradition was born Jesus, with Mary and Saint Joseph around the figure of the little newborn child. In another nearby part were the Magi riding on their camels to the place where the baby Jesus was born, and in another corner, 
an angel announced the good news to a group of shepherds. Nancy was impressed by the artistic beauty of the nativity scene and she was puzzled by its presence in the Scottish mansion of a British aristocrat who was not Catholic. My mother was Italian, and Italy is the homeland of the nativity scene. And honestly, it seems to me a very beautiful and lovely tradition, with a lot of artistic value and with a great sentimental meaning for me, more than you can imagine, said William, and his voice broke a bit of emotion at the end, and his eyes they got wet. Frank Catelli put a hand on William's shoulder and then turned to see Nancy with a smile. What William says is true. The tradition of the nativity scene was initiated by St. Francis of Assisi in Italy in the year 1223, who made the representation in a cave with people of flesh and bone, and animals. Quickly the idea became popular and spread throughout Italy, it replacing the actors of flesh and bone with ceramic figures or other materials. And from Italy, the tradition spread to other Catholic countries and became especially popular in Spain, and from Spain spread it to all the territories of its empire, so in the Spanish-speaking countries of America it is also very popular," explained Frank Catelli with a charming smile as she looked at Nancy with an intense and seductive gaze. But Victoria did not notice anything, because again she was absent. Upon seeing the nativity scene, Victoria's mind flew to the end of her reverie when she was sitting on the floor, dressed in strange ancient clothes and barefoot, in a strange place, she surrounded by unknown people. But now her mind moved on to another confusing scene, a scene in which she walked at night under a starry sky and headed to a place lit by the fire of a bonfire, a place where something extraordinary awaited her. Victoria came out of her reverie when she felt Nancy's hand on her arm and heard her voice. Vicky. William was inviting us to accompany him to the library, Nancy said with a bewildered gaze fixed on Victoria. Victoria nodded and the group began to walk towards the library, and discreetly Nancy whispered in Victoria's ear. What's wrong with you today, Victoria? Nancy asked intrigued and a little worried. Nothing, just nerves, for the project, Victoria lied in low voice. William, Frank Catelli, Victoria, and Nancy took their seats in the library, which looked like a mixture of a classic library of an old mansion with a modern office, probably fitted out so that the owner of the house could run his business from that country home. At a large table, the four were leafing through a few copies of a document that William had printed from his computer. Sincerely, I really liked your script, Victoria. And I gave it to Frank Catelli to give me his opinion and he also liked it a lot. That's why I am inclined to support your project," said William speaking in a friendly tone but with the professional image of a businessman. In the following conversation, they talked about how Victoria, after having written a romantic novel that had some publishing success, a period drama, had written a screenplay for a television series, which was also a romantic story and a period drama. Then Victoria and her friend Nancy, who was also her co-worker in a company dedicated to social media marketing, had created a project to promote the production of the television series written by Victoria, they advertising it among Victoria's readers. Looking for executive producers who were willing to finance the production of the series, they had finally reached the gates of William who owned most of the shares in a major television production company. William had shown interest in the project and had convinced them through his representatives so that both women would come to their Scottish country residence in the middle of December to discuss the project in person. In the talk, William praised several aspects of the script and asked some questions to Victoria about details. It is certainly a very interesting story, it could potentially be a new Downton Abbey, said William while continuing to leaf through a printed copy of the script, with his glasses on. Definitely will not be a new Downton Abbey, said Victoria looking a bit angry. William raised an eyebrow, Frank Catelli gave a surprised gesture and Nancy kicked Victoria's leg under the table, and when Victoria turned to see her, Nancy saw her with a gesture on her face as if to say, I'm going to kill you Victoria. Excuse me, William, what happens is when Nancy and I tried to get investors for our project, we heard too often the comparisons with Downton Abbey. Some asked me if it was a kind of copy of Downton or if I had been inspired by Downton, which showed me that they had not really read the script or had not understood it. 
Others told me that if I wanted to get it produced, I had to change it to make it more like Downton, which was what the viewers wanted to see, as a witch told me. I mean, a lady who ran a production company. Do not think, I hate Downton Abbey, on the contrary, my mother and I were fans of Downton, and it's a series that I respect and admire, a masterpiece, but I did not want to make a copy of Downton. I think that when someone tries to copy a cult series to obtain the same success, the result is a mediocre work, simply a cheap copy, and in the case of a work of romantic fiction, it ends up making a cheap soap opera. That's why I did not want to make a copy of Downton, I wanted to do an original work, with a much darker and more raw plot than Downton, a plot with complex characters with deeper and controversial motivations, characters who are not saints or demons and who suffer stormy passions. That's why my story is more visceral than Downton's, explained Victoria sincerely, proud and excited. I think you could not make a better defense of your work, Victoria. I agree with your analysis, and all those things that you have quoted are the ones that have made me bet on your project. Well, we will, William replied. Are you going to produce my series? Victoria asked surprised and excited. Yes, I have already discussed the issue with the CEO of the production company of which I am a shareholder, and I just wanted to confirm my decision after speaking with you face to face. Now it's just a matter of lawyers preparing contracts, although later the hardest part will come, which is to start working on pre-production, that as you will see is a stage of a lot of work, but also exciting, said William with a smile. Nancy and Victoria had to contain their excitement because they just wanted to jump on the table, to celebrate. William asked the employees for a bottle to toast with them and with Francatelli. That night Victoria went to bed happy and could not remember the dreams of the previous night. Soon she fell asleep deeply and then fell back into a dream. Victoria walked through old corridors, like those of her previous dream. When she passed by a mirror she saw herself in it and then saw that she was dressed like her twin from the previous dream, that in fact, she was now that woman. But she was not afraid, because a conviction had awakened in her, the conviction that she was that woman. She went to a door that gave access to a room and saw that a footman made a gesture to open the door to announce her, but with an imperious gesture she stopped him and ordered him to leave. Her voice was laden with incredible authority in that reality, and the servant withdrew with a bowing. She turned the door handle and had to inspire, to slow down her racing heart, and felt her eyes were wet, but she held back the tears. Victoria entered the room and saw that there was a man sitting in an armchair, by the fire of a fireplace. The man was dressed in a sleeping gown that he wore over his nightwear, and he was wearing slippers. The man seemed to be dozing but when he heard Victoria enter the room he woke up and then he saw her with white eyes, with a gesture of surprise. In a small corner of Victoria's mind, that corner that was still anchored to the current reality, she felt a great surprise. The man seemed to be William Cartwright, the host of Victoria, but he looked much older, because if Mr. Cartwright appeared to be no older than 45, besides well preserved for his age, the man on the armchair appeared to be over 60 years old and he looked sick, with a very haggard appearance. His hair was almost completely grey and deep wrinkles were showing on his face, especially around his sad eyes. But still it was possible to admire the beauty and charm in the face of a man who had been irresistibly handsome for most of his life. But strangely in Victoria's mind, in that dream, there was the conviction that this man was not Cartwright, and in fact, that name was diluted until it disappeared, like a speck of dust in the air. And Victoria felt her mind returning to its place, that all the pieces fit together as if she had been confused before. Now she only felt a cumulus of mixed feelings, pain, nostalgia, happiness, worry, compassion, anxiety, uncertainty. She stepped forward and spoke to the man in the armchair. Lord M. Victoria exclaimed as a greeting, with as much emotion as if in those two words was condensed all the happiness and all the pain of the world.